Hola, CyberCamp. My name is Alicia Clock. I'm a technical program manager at Lyft uh, in security and privacy, um, which basically means that my job is to ensure that uh, everybody in the company is able to implement our security and privacy programs. I'm here to talk to you today about how you can succeed in cybersecurity, even if you never really thought that that was where you were going to go with your life. So, first off, you may be aware that there is a uh, extreme shortage of cybersecurity professionals. Uh, one estimate predicts that there will be six million jobs in cybersecurity by 2020, and that 1.5 million of those jobs will be unfilled. So we need you. We need a lot of people coming in and joining us in the cybersecurity field. But we don't just need bodies. We need diverse bodies. We need people with experience from all walks of life, from all kinds of backgrounds. If without people who are diverse, without people who have experienced many different things, uh, we can't protect everybody. Let me give you a quick example. How many of you know Google Hangouts? You familiar? OK. Um, how many of you remember old Gchat, the precursor to Hangouts? OK. Um, so I'm a big fan of old Gchat for one pr particular reason. Uh, in Gchat, you're able to set your status as invisible, which meant that uh, you were online, but nobody could see that you were online. They didn't know, you know, were you there, were you away, uh, what was going on. And when I was working at Google, I participated in a user study by the Hangouts team. They wanted to know why I was still using old Gchat. They, and I said, because of invisible mode, because Hangouts didn't have it at the time. And they said, why would you want to be invisible? Don't you want your friends to know when you're online? Don't you want to you know, have them be able to find you? And I said, well, yes, if everybody in my contacts book was a friend of mine. But that's not necessarily the case. When I was in high school, I had a stalker. This person would uh, hunt me down, harass me, send me emails. And if they saw me on Gchat, they would chat at me all the time. Invisible mode let me still use Gchat, but my stalker didn't know that uh, I was on, and so they couldn't come and harass me. And so I told this to the Google Hangouts team, and they were, they were shocked. They had honestly never thought about that, that there might be a situation where you wouldn't want somebody to know uh, your online status. Um, for them, they thought it was a really awesome feature, that your friends would always know, you know, okay, they're on their phone or they're away, so I shouldn't message them right now. You know, they weren't sitting there going, wah ha ha ha, like we're gonna take away your privacy by taking away your ability to hide your status. They genuinely thought they were helping. They just hadn't been exposed to a situation where that wasn't helpful. So, fast forward a few months, thanks, I think, in part to uh, my telling the, the, the Hangouts team this, you can now hide your status in Google Hangouts. So that's why we need people from all walks of life. We need people who aren't just your typical uh, hacker, you aren't just your typical cyber uh, security person. We need people who have had experiences like being stalked or living uh, in another country or coming from a different culture or whatever your background is. We need you. We need you to help protect people like you. We need to bring your ideas into the community. Now, you may be wondering, why do I talk about you know, diverse backgrounds and, and all of this? Um, what qualifies me to say you, know, you should t leave your uh, existing job and you know, come join cybersecurity? That's me uh, when I graduated high school a while ago. Uh, when I graduated, I was going to go to Hollywood and be a screenwriter. So I went to Vancouver Film School, and I got a screenwriting degree. I was going to write for movies and television. Um, fast forward about 12, 13 years, and here I am giving talks at major industry conferences. So I do have some experience in uh, coming from a completely different place than your traditional cybersecurity background. Um, so how did I get from Vancouver Film School, where I was going to be a screenwriter, to working for some very big names in the technical industry? Uh, I learned 
three main things along the way, and it's these three things that I want to share with you in the hopes that you can take them and apply them to your own life and come and join us in cybersecurity. Uh, before I tell you what those are, I'm going to say you'll notice that none of them are, are technical things. I'm not going to sit here and give you a list of you need to know um, these encryption algorithms or you need to know how to do pen testing, none of that. Uh, there's been a lot of really amazing people already on this stage and at this conference talking about uh, the technical things that will be helpful for you in your life as in cybersecurity. I'm going to talk to you about some more general things, um, things that, will that you might not learn in a textbook, that might, you know, they won't come up on a list of what you need to know. And hopefully you'll be able to use them in your own life. So the first thing that I learned was how are you going to make it happen? So this happened uh, when I was a kid. I was really big into Taekwondo. I would go to all the classes, and I would go to competitions, and I would practice all the time. And one day, my studio announced that uh, they were going to send a delegation to South Korea of students to train with some famous South Korean Taekwondo masters. And I really wanted to go. Uh, problem. I was 15 at the time. and. I was living in Michigan. So that's how far Michigan is from South Korea. Uh, it's not exactly an overnight uh, camp. Any respectable parent, any, any parent in their right mind would have said, you're 15, you can't go across the world for two weeks unsupervised. But my mom didn't say that. She said, how are you going to make it happen? And that caught me a little bit off guard because honestly, I was kind of expecting her to say no. Um, but she said, how are you going to make it happen? So I thought about it, and I said, all right, I'm going to need to fundraise. I'm going to need to find somebody at my school who's also going, who can be my chaperone, so that you know my parents are reassured that somebody's in charge of me. Um, and I did all of these things. Long story short, I went to South Korea. Um, now, my mom didn't just come up with this out of nowhere. Uh, she said, how are you going to make it happen instead of no? Because when she was in college, somebody told her no. This is my mom uh, when she was in college in the late 1960s. Um, but at the time, in the late 1960s uh, in Michigan, women were only allowed to be three things. You could be a teacher, secretary, or a nurse. That was it. That was your options. Uh, my mom was really into mathematics. She loves advanced mathematics. She wanted to go be a rocket scientist, like an actual, like, put rockets on the moon rocket scientist. Um, but her options were teacher, secretary, or nurse. So she said, all right, I'll be a teacher. But I'm not going to stop there. So through, her uh, through the course of her career as a teacher, she found out about something called FIRST Robotics. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, it's a robotics competition for high schoolers where you build uh, robots to solve practical real-life challenges. This is my mom a couple years ago with the robot that they built that year. I have absolutely no idea what the robot is supposed to be doing, but it's a robot, it did things. Um, but my mom got there because she didn't let anybody say, you can't. She, taught, she learned to ask herself, how are you going to make it happen? She didn't just say, well, I'm going to be a teacher, that's it, I don't get to do anything cool. She went out and she found a way to become an award-winning roboticist. So this is applied beyond just getting me to South Korea. Uh, in my career, um, I mentioned I started out as uh, getting a screenwriting degree at Vancouver Film School, um, which is fine and dandy, except I uh, graduated film school in 2004. Um, these are the movies that were coming out in 2004. You will notice Volume 2, Shrek 2, sequel, book adaptation, uh, no new properties, no anything new and exciting. Hollywood didn't want screenwriters. So I needed to get a job to support myself. So I got a job at the law office. If you've ever been in a law office, you might have seen these rows of books. These are the laws, the case files, the things that lawyers need to study in order to do their jobs. Um, they don't want to have to reprint these every time uh, the laws get updated because that would be a lot of reprinting. So the way they do it is those are three ring binders and they just print the pages with the new laws. You take out the old pages and you stick in the new ones. So I was doing that one summer in, at this law office job and I was reading the pages that I was putting in these new laws. 
And this was in 2005. And these laws in Michigan in 2005 were just acknowledging that computers existed. Not that you could do anything with them, not that cybercrime existed, not that any of that existed, just that computers existed in 2005. And I said, that's ridiculous. Um, somebody should do something about that. And then I thought about it. I was like, well, I have a screenwriting degree. What can I do about it? But then I asked myself, how am I going to make it happen? So I researched, and I discovered that computer forensics, technology forensics, is a place where the law and technology uh, come together very closely. And I found a school that offered a, a degree in computer forensics, and I graduated a second time uh, with a degree in computer forensics because I didn't want to stay put. I asked myself, how am I going to make it happen? So when you come across a problem in your life, something that you see this isn't right, this needs to be fixed, um, and you say, you know, maybe I don't have the skills, or maybe, like, I'm too young, or maybe, 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 don't just let it go. Ask yourself, how am I going to make it happen? The second thing that I learned uh, is go look it up. When I was a kid, little kid learning to read, I would go and I would ask my dad uh, when I found a word that I didn't understand. And he would always tell me, go look it up. Uh, now, I'm old enough that when my dad said, go look it up, he meant in a dictionary, or worse, an encyclopedia. Uh, if you're old like me, you probably remember these and uh, how tricky it could be. You had to hope that the dictionary was up to date enough that the volume that you needed in the encyclopedia was not checked out of the library or just missing. Um, even as I got older and went to high school, these, this is the search engines that I was dealing with in high school. This is what it looked like before Google. I couldn't pull out my phone. I couldn't say, hey, Google, or hey, Siri, um, and ask for help. I had to look it up in a dictionary or an encyclopedia or in the library. Now. Uh, it seems like a very mundane skill. Let's open a dictionary, look it up. But if you've ever provided tech support for your uh, technologically challenged friends and family, you've done something similar. Uh, if you don't read XKCD, first off, you should. Uh, it's a very good comic. But this is a comic that they printed a couple years back where uh, it's the uh, tech support flow for people who are providing tech support to uh, friends and family which is basically, uh, we don't know every program out there. You know, mom, if you call me up and you say, how do I use this random, pro I don't know this random program. I really don't. What I do know is I know how to look for a button that probably will do what I want, and I know to push it and see what happens. And if it worked, fantastic. I fixed the problem. And if not, I know how to keep looking. I know how to go on Google and say, Google, uh, tell me, how to do this thing in this program. I know how to read, uh, to find, and to read the help manuals in programs. So I don't have to know every program that's out there. I just have to know how to look it up. This has been very valuable in my professional career. Um, when I went and got my computer forensics degree, I had one whole class in Unix and Linux. It was not a very good class. The instructor put a few man pages on some PowerPoints and uh, read them to us in a dark room. It was very boring. Uh, but when I went and got my first job, they, I, my first day, they came and they said to me, do you know any Unix or Linux? And I said, well, I took one class in college, but and they said, great. Nobody else knows anything about Unix and Linux. You're our Unix Linux expert now. <laughs> and I was like, so I could have said, no, I don't know anything, I can't do that. I could have, but this was my first day on the job, my first job out of, out of college. I didn't want to look bad, so I said, all right, I'm going to go look it up. And I went and I researched, I read man pages, I went on Stack Exchange, and I found uh, other questions, other things that people had asked, and I figured out how to do it, and I actually became our office's Unix Linux expert. Other people came to me with questions. Um, and I was able to answer them because I looked it up. It happened again when I moved from Boeing to Google. Uh, Google uses a lot of MacBooks, and part of uh, Google's security process is to read the MacBook logs uh, 
to generate security alerts if something looks weird. But nobody on the security team knew anything about Mac logs. Uh, just everybody knew Linux syslogs, but not Mac logs, because it's similar but different enough to be a problem. Um, and so all of our parsers, uh, the parsers are the, the code that um, reads through the logs and pulls out things that you might uh, want an alert on, they were all broken because nobody knew anything about Mac logs and nobody knew how to fix them. So I could have said, I don't know anything about Mac logs, I'm not going to touch those. Everybody else on my team had said the same thing. That was why the parsers were so broken. Um, but I said, we need those alerts. So I'm going to look it up. And I did. I figured out how to parse Mac logs. I fixed all of our parsers. And I became the Mac logs expert on our team. So something important uh, to note, aside from just going to look something up, is that it's OK to ask these questions. It's OK to need to look something up. You, it, cybersecurity is a massive field. No one person can know everything in it. It's not possible. You can't hold that much information in your head. And you shouldn't have to. Um, you should be able to say, I don't know, but I'm going to look it up. I don't know, but I'm going to ask somebody. Um, that's why we have teams, because we can't do everything all on our own. You need to have people who know a lot about this thing and somebody else who knows a lot about that thing. You work together, and then that way you can ask each other, you can support each other, and get your questions answered. The third thing that I've learned uh, over the course of my career uh, is a little bit more abstract. It's, I have an opportunity for you. Now, you are almost never going to have somebody walk up to you and just say, I have an opportunity for you. It doesn't work like that. But it happens, and you have to listen for it. They're not going to say those words, but it'll be happening anyway. Um, now, sometimes you will get lucky. Sometimes, you know, Jedi Master Qui-Gon will swoop down on his ship out of the sky and see how awesome you are at pod racing and sweep you out of your mundane life and you go be a Jedi. Um, if that happens, fantastic. You're super lucky and take advantage of it. More often than not, though, uh, you're going to have to go way out of your way, uh, work really hard to convince somebody that they have an opportunity for you. You're going to have to show them why, you're, uh, why you deserve this opportunity. You have to show them that you're ready. You have to convince them to give it to you. Um, I've had a few times in my life where people have given me an opportunity. Uh, the first was my senior year of college, uh, when I was getting my forensics degree, my class participated in the uh, Collegiate Cyber Defense Challenge, which is a uh, red team, blue team exercise. Um, if you don't know what a red team, blue team exercise is, uh, you have the red team, who are the attackers, the bad guys trying to break into your system. You have the blue team, which was us, the student teams, uh, defending your network. But the CCDC added in an extra wrinkle. They added in something they called the white team, which was the white collar executives of the company that, as a blue team, you were defending. And you had to uh, sometimes stop your defense, or one person would stop the defense, everybody else would keep going, and go and present to the white team. The white team might come and say, we want you to upgrade all of our servers to the newest operating system right now. Or they might say, we want to install retina scanners on all of our laptops, because we saw it in the matrix, and it was really cool. Um, and you would have to go and explain why that might not be the best idea. Um, but because I had theater background, because I had gone and got my screenwriting degree, I was less afraid to get up in front of the white team as everybody else on my team. So I got to go do it. And so I made all these presentations to the white team. And after the competition was over, uh, one of the men who'd been on the white team came up to me and he said, I work at Boeing. You really impressed me. I want you to come work for me. And I was shocked. Because for one, I didn't know that Boeing did anything other than airplanes. Turns out they have a very extensive cybersecurity division. Um, and I said, all right. So I applied. I did the interview. And a few months later, I was working at Boeing. It happened again. Uh, when I switched over to Google. Um, I started at Google on the security team. Uh, but Google has a lot of internal uh, forums where employees 
we'll talk about new policies, new features, um, ideas, things like that. And I was a very vocal supporter of privacy for users on these forums. You know, people would say, hey, I've got this idea for a feature, and I would say, you know, how are you going to protect user privacy? And one day out of the blue, I got an email from a manager on the privacy team, and he said, I'm starting a new privacy engineering team, and I want you to be on it, because I've seen how vocal you are about privacy. Um, now, something to keep in mind with these two things in particular, it sounds lucky, you know, the guy from Boeing comes up and says, I want you to work for me. The guy in the privacy team says, I want you to join my privacy team. Um, but if I hadn't gone to the cyber defense challenge, if I hadn't been a vocal supporter of privacy, they wouldn't have known about me. They wouldn't have seen me. They wouldn't have had the, any idea that I existed. I had to put myself out there. I had to create that opportunity for myself. And when I did, people came up to me and gave it to me. Um, the third time, this was my uh, go see Yoda in Dagobah uh, experience. Um, once I joined the privacy team at Google, uh, I noticed that we were doing a lot of really cool things with privacy and security at Google, um, but we weren't talking about them. Google doesn't like to talk externally about security and privacy for a variety of reasons, but I said, you know, we're missing out. We should be talking about this. We're doing amazing work in here, and I think people should know about it. And so I went to my manager, and I said, I want to talk about Google security and privacy at DEF CON. Now, if you're familiar at all with DEF CON, it's a major uh, cybersecurity conference, but more importantly, it is a conference of hackers who are extremely distrustful of large companies like Google. Um, it was not going to be the most hospitable place to give a talk about security and privacy at Google. And my manager knew this, and he said, I think you're nuts, but you know what? If you want to try it, have at. So I said, all right. So I went and I talked to Google's lawyers. I talked to the PR team. I found out um, what I could say and what I couldn't say because of laws, regulations, um, I talked to other privacy and security teams, and I found out cool things that they were doing. And, whoops, uh, and I got to go talk at DEF CON, which was great. I came back, and another manager at Google contacted me, and she said, I was supposed to talk at this other security conference, but I can't go. I want you to go. Can you, can you take my place? Because you just gave this great talk at DEF CON, you have some experience speaking in front of people. Can you do that? And I said, sure. Um, so I went and I talked. And uh, this was the Women in Cybersecurity Conference where uh, I got a lot of attention from recruiters, including one from Lyft. And the recruiter got in touch with me and said, we want you on our security privacy team at Lyft. And I said, all right, let's do this. But again, I had to put myself out there. I had to convinced my manager to let me talk at DEF CON. I had to put the talk together. I had to get it accepted at DEF CON. I had to do all of this work. And then I had to go and do it, and do it well, enough that somebody would come and say, you did good. I'm going to give you this extra little opportunity. And it wasn't even much, honestly. It was just another speaking engagement. But you never know when what seems like a little opportunity is going to turn into a big career change. So listen for when people are saying these things to you. Listen for where there are opportunities that you can reach out and make a difference. When you see them, fight for them. So that's all fine and dandy. It's a lot of stories about my life and my career. How does that help you? So I want you to think about how are you going to make it happen? Uh, your career in cybersecurity, where do you want to start? There's a ton of cybersecurity disciplines. You've got cryptography, you've got penetration testing, you've got incident detection and response, you've got computer forensics, you've got malware reverse engineering, and tons more. There are lots and lots and lots of different areas within cybersecurity. Um, pick one. Ask yourself how you're going to, to become an expert in it. Um, and then make it happen. Take classes go to school. You don't have to have a degree. I've had managers at Google and elsewhere that don't have a, a college degree at all. It's not required. 
What's required is that you know what you're talking about. So make it happen. Go learn, educate yourself, read about these things. Um, which leads me into my next point. Look it up. Uh, when you run into something that you don't know, look it up, ask questions. Stay on top of uh, cybersecurity news. Uh, know what's going on in the cyberspace. Um, know what attacks are prevalent right now. Know what companies are worried about. Know what's coming up uh, under the radar right now, but that will probably be a problem in a few months or years. Um, read books. There are books out there on every aspect of cybersecurity that you can imagine. They are very, very in-depth books. There are very broad books. Um, they're out there. Some of them are free. Some of them are cheap. Some of them are not so cheap. <laughs> but read them. Find them and read them. And then go out and put your knowledge to the test. Uh, CyberCamp had a variety of challenges. Um, I'm sure some of you participated in them, uh, the Capture the Flag challenges and the other ones. Um, but there's more out there. Uh, find them. You know, even if you don't know anything, there are ones that are geared towards people who've never done a Capture the Flag challenge before. There are other challenges like uh, DEF CON Darknet, which are designed not, you know, to beat each other down and get the most points, but to learn and teach others. Um, go out and participate in these and test these things that you've looked up and taught yourself. And finally, listen for when people say, I have an opportunity for you. Because again, they're probably not going to say those exact words to you. They're probably going to, it, the opportunity might be there, but you'll have to convince them to give it to you. So going out to conferences like this, you're all here. That is a fantastic start. Uh, you're here, you're meeting people, you're finding out what opportunities, what opportunities exist. Um, go to others. Um, these are some of the big names. DEF CON B-sides are huge in the cyberspace, but there's more. If you uh, Google your country or your local area and cybersecurity conference, you will probably find one. You will probably find several. Um, some of them are free. Some of them aren't free. Some of them, you, if you have an employer already in cybersecurity, um, you can talk your employer into paying for you to go because it's job relevant. Find a way to do it. Find a way to get there. And while you're there, while you're here, meet people. Talk to people. If I hadn't gone and presented to the white team, if I hadn't talked to the man from Boeing afterwards, if I hadn't talked to my manager, if I hadn't put myself out there on the forums at Google, um, I never would have met the people who could give me the opportunity. So reach out to other people that are here. When you walk out of here, look around you, see who's sitting next to you. That might be your next coworker, your next employee, your next boss, the person that you might call the next time your network goes down and you need help. Um, get to know the people uh, in the cybersecurity space. Don't just sit at your computer all alone. Cybersecurity is a very, very uh, social field, believe it or not. You need to know people, you need to know who's out there, and you need to be able to give the, convince them to give you an opportunity. But not just that. You need to be ready for when someone comes up to you and they say, I want you to give me an opportunity. Because you might be the person who has the opportunity for somebody else. You never know. So be out there, be listening for it. Go meet other people. Look up the things that you need to know and make it happen. Thank you very much. Any questions? Hello, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for your speech. It was very uh, inspirational. Uh, I would like to know uh, why you decided to switch between uh, Boeing and Google. It was a, 
um, economic motivation or just you were looking for a, a new challenge or something? Thank you. Sure. Um, so the reason I decided to switch between uh, Boeing and Google goes into US politics a little bit. Um, if you remember back in 2012, I think it was, um, the US government, the Republicans and Democrats were, were fighting over budget and they basically said, um, all right, we're going to put something called sequestration in our budget, which is basically um, if we can't agree on a budget by this date, we're going to cut funding for everything. Nobody gets any money. And everybody thought that would be enough uh, to scare people into making a budget, but it didn't work. So uh, at the end of 2012, um, the US government's defense budget got drastically cut. And Boeing at the time, uh, most of their cybersecurity division was working for the US government. So all of a sudden, there was no money to pay Boeing. There was no money for any of the Boeing cybersecurity programs. Um, so my team got broken up. We got outsourced. Uh, they were trying to figure out what to do with all of us. And I said, you know what? I'm not going to wait for them to figure out what to do with me. I'm going to figure out what to do with myself. And honestly, um, it was on a whim that I applied to Google. I was looking on uh, LinkedIn and I saw Google had a job posting for a security engineer and I said, you know, I'm never going to get in, but I might as well try, see how far I get. And oops, I got in. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, that was, it was uh, me deciding that I wasn't going to wait for uh, Boeing to figure itself out after their budget got cut. I said, I'm going to figure out what I want to do for myself. Oh. <laughs> I get like an audio chorus here. It's great. Um, any other questions? Uh, hello. Uh, I'm asking myself uh, one question. Uh, when you start, uh, you were talking about uh, the invisible mode on the Google Hangouts. Um, I, I'm not going to say this is true, but I've met some American people mm -hmm. that told me that uh, the social life is not as, as big as in other countries. And I'm wondering myself if in America, for example, Facebook, Google, uh, these companies uh, develop uh, the social media in internet mm -hmm. uh, that maybe is not the best place to do it. I mean, if, uh, if you have to compare your own personal life and then put that personal life into a computer, maybe there is a problem over there. Uh, for example, when, when you want to stay uh, no one to see you and everything, mm -hmm. and maybe you don't think about this, but maybe it can happen in, in other terms, in Facebook, for example. What do you think? Um, so I think that uh, a lot of it is about awareness, because you're right, uh, no one social media uh, company can like represent me. You know, I'm... I don't have Facebook personally, um, but like my Twitter profile isn't all of me. It's it's my professional profile. Um, the other social media that I use, they're not uh, everything a part of me, and that's that's very human. Um, humans are never all of ourselves to everybody in exactly the same way all the time. Um, we compartmentalize. We interact differently with different people. You know, you're you're going to act differently around your grandmother, for example, than around uh, your girlfriend or boyfriend. Um, and I think as consumers, uh, it's really important to understand where those dividing lines are. Um, it might mean that you have different social media profiles because, you know, if you're on Facebook and your grandmother and your girlfriend or boyfriend are on the same feed, it's a little awkward because how do you be your true self to your grandmother and your boyfriend, girlfriend at the same time? Um, part of it is also uh, making it known to the companies that make these social media products that we want this ability to compartmentalize. So Facebook is a good example of this. You know, people said, we don't want everybody to see everything all the time. 
and they've implemented ways you can say, you know, only let this group of people see this post, or only let this group of people see this part of me. It's not perfect yet. Um, it's still, it's actually, like, it feels like Facebook has been there forever, but it's really not that old, what, 10, 15 years? I don't remember, but, you know, not that old. And so these companies are learning and they're listening. They, they want you to use their services, but that means that they have to make a service that you want to use. And so you have to, uh, if there's something that's missing from one of these social media uh, sites that will help you better um, represent yourself in a way that makes sense to you and to the people that you're representing yourself to, then you need to tell the companies this. You need to make it known that this is what you want so that they know to build it. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much.